The sound of the moment of atomic fission is a thin, compulsive music, the indefinable orchestration of immense invisible forces disciplined inside a kind of terrible elegance. The powerhouses of the nuclear age are quiet and clean, stark and sterile. This country has many of them spread across the land, at Berkeley and Bradwell, at Hunterston, at Trousfinny, at Dungeness and Oldbury, at Sizewell, at Wilfer and Hinkley Point, ranging in output from 300 to 1,000 megawatts. This country uses the incalculable power of the atom in the reasonable causes of peace. It's come to terms with it and civilized it. It generates power for the country's national network. It's recruited into the mechanics and control of industrial processes. The isotopes planted like seeds in the ocean help to chart the tides to map the movements of the sea itself. Seed grain passes a radioactive field to destroy bacteria, all the time expanding man's awareness of his mysterious environment and more of himself. There is a laboratory in which man's self-examination has broken through a secret older than all his ancestors, with the discovery that in the chromosomes of a human cell, there's an acid which, in fact, transmits hereditary characteristics from one generation to the next simply the continuity of mortal life. The curiosity of science has no dimensions. From the minutely small and intimate, it inquires into the vast and eternal, where the radio telescope probes into the immeasurable distances of the universe. It happens in this land. This land is Britain. It is a small country encircled and challenged forever by a sea that beats and chafes on the rocky edges of an island. It is a small nation. It covers less of the world than one American state. It's smaller by far than one Soviet Republic. Yet it is curiously various. A cosmopolitan people who have absorbed the races of the world since that last Norman conquest nine centuries ago, living together in a coherent society that finds a comparable dignity in the crofters' cottages and the great houses of the past. From their earliest days, they scattered their countryside with the monuments to their faith, and as the small and simple churches merged into the face of the land, other great cathedrals grew to proclaim their own splendid certainties of stone and spire. The profile of Britain is one of continuity, challenge and change. Here, Shakespeare wrote his sonnets, Milton of Paradise Lost, and Karl Marx of his picture of a paradise he never found. And the heart of the place is, of course, London. An argumentative, restless place, like all places where people insist upon being meaningful and value their right to stroll and stand and stare and dispute as they will within the context of a fundamental constitutional core. Every British Parliament is opened by the Sovereign, driving in state from Buckingham Palace to the Palace of Westminster. This is a ritual as old as democracy, and, perhaps surprisingly, part of it. My Lords, members of the House of Commons, throughout the coming session, my government will continue to give resolute support to the work of the United Nations. The improvement of relations between East and West remains a primary object of their policy. The system is archaic and odd and enduring. You don't try to rationalize a historical continuity that stretches from Plantagenet kings to Victorian politicians. Today, the British reach one more punctuation mark in a long and crowded story. How often have they been written off by enemies, despaired of by friends? How often have they confounded them by continuing so obstinately to survive, and indeed to prosper? It took resource and a notable capacity for absorbing derision with equanimity, if not indeed a certain perverse pride. It also took invention and some resoundingly good ideas. In 1919, the atom was first smashed by Lord Rutherford at Cambridge. A hundred years earlier, James Watt, the Scotsman from Greenock, observed the curiosity that steam was strong. He harnessed its pressure to the wheel and changed the face of the world. 
1825, George Stevenson went one better, and between Stockton and Darlington was built the world's first public railroad. The British invented a bicycle and put the world on wheels. It then became obviously necessary to invent the pneumatic tyre. They invented the sandwich, named after the noble lord who simultaneously invented built-in indigestion. They produced the electric light bulb, thus ensuring one more permanent issue of domestic dispute. They gave the world steel and steamships, and were then obliged to invent radar and television. They built and flew the world's first passenger-carrying jet aircraft, discovered the neutron key to nuclear fission. Their molecular biologists found the genetic clue to all human identity. But their own identity, what of that now? Never before have the British so earnestly and objectively examined themselves and their institutions in fair weather and, well, the usual kind. What then do they see when they survey their nation? A life lived predominantly in cities. A life congested and mingled in every way. A society deeply adjusted to the daily demands of living together in patience and tolerance, of the insistence of close quarters. For this is not a country of enormous distances. Nevertheless, the British use up the most elaborate network of communications anywhere. One thing the British are most keenly aware of, that every day there are more and more of them. They multiply and they grow. This is everyone's concern, everyone's pleasure, and everyone's problem. No country in the world has enough education, nor has Britain, but every year it increases. More children, more schools, new schools, new designs, new methods. This, if anything could be, is the great investment in the future. The nation, after all, has so many identities, so many different selves and characters, so closely linked. Cardiff is the capital of Wales, whose valleys once heard the clamor of the world's first industrial revolution, a land most vividly and insistently conscious of its own especial national identity. The news in Welsh follows immediately. It is a country of forges and foundries, mills and mines, Tallyman and Tenors, for Wales is Wales, yet integrally built into Britain. And so is Belfast across the water, capital of Northern Ireland, traditionally home of the linen weavers, of engineers, above all of shipbuilders. This is the great Ulster craft, the making of huge things. The yards of Belfast have sent many a splendid ship down their slipways, many a liner and tanker and tramp. The seas of the world are full of vessels that knew their conception, gestation and birth in these cold Irish waters. And so were many more. Probably the most celebrated of all ship's bells is the lutine bell at Lloyd's, which still rings to announce big events at sea in the great chamber they call the room. Biggest room in the world, they say. Home of the vast insurance corporation that has no parallel in any other country. Here in London is the center of the world's insurance, as London is a center of international banking, of world finance and trade. And Lloyd's of London, which began as a coffee shop, endures as a word in the language. Scotland is her own nation. Edinburgh is the capital of a people with a deep concept of independence, with their own ways and their own laws, and much pride in the product of their special experience, the monumental masterpieces of stock breeding, the cattle that fortify the herds of many countries. 
and their breeders travel out to the markets of the Scottish islands, flying to the Hebridean sales to enrich their herds with the tough, enduring animals of the West. This is the outer edge of Britain, the Celtic fringe, remote and far divided from the cities, where the granite perimeter of the kingdom drifts into the Atlantic. The greatest suspension bridge in Europe grows day like an aerial causeway across the River Forth. A steel filigree of girders and rivets and skill and daring, hanging the highway to the north on a span of steel and a web of wire. For a constantly increasing people, nothing can stand still. The necessary new must be forever going up and the useless old must go. There can never be enough new homes. Not only new homes, but new towns, new communities created in a new image, with a new concept of urban life, freer, more relaxed, less tormented by traffic in the contemporary notion of municipality. Less dominated by the old ideas in every field, liberated from the Fustian traditions of the past, dedicated to the simple principle that no citizen is too young for creation of some kind and has the right to determine his own ideas of how his world should appear. For of such is the kingdom of childhood, which does not, after all, last for long. Nor is it ever too soon to learn that the physical world has rules too and that all the chemistry of life can be seen in a test tube. It's sometimes hard to say where the present ends and the future begins. With a plastic frame and a mile of wire, a man can now build his own brains, construct the computers that are part of the pattern of our time, the nerveless, calculating creatures whose intricate processes must continually advance the frontiers of industrial automation. Nothing escapes. The milkmaid of the 20th century is a machine too. The three-legged stool and the foaming pail are hard to find. Today, the basic principle of a dairy farming people is now synthesized into a system of pumps and tubes. Only the disciplined cow is permitted to manufacture the end product in the conventional way. For the rest, it all comes down to a carton. But more than anything, perhaps, the nation lives on the product of the fire and the furnace, the mine and the metal and the mangle, steel, the framework of almost everything on which the world depends, the brace and girder and strut and stay of every industrial economy on earth. For much of Britain, this is more than a trade or a technique. It's almost a vocation. And today, industrial innovation has conquered the most sacred and hallowed of traditions. Even tea time may well be automated. From one plant, 750 tractors and 1,000 trucks a week. From one new production line in Scotland, 150,000 automobiles a year. bigger, faster,
harder, tougher, more elaborate. A difference not of degree, but of kind, only to be determined in the wind tunnels of the aeronautical laboratory. What must you do to design and make an aircraft that will carry passengers at more than twice the speed of sound? What metals will withstand the heat and the strain? What shape will most subtly and usefully make the journey from London to New York in less than three hours? To Australia and back in a day? The model must be the scapegoat first, exposed to its stresses, watched like a firstborn, tested, examined, calibrated and computed. Here in the wind tunnel, the fearful forces plot their pattern by proxy. And one day, we shall know. But life isn't all a study of stresses and strains, and being a seaside race has its random compensations. The wild illusion that the British take their pleasures sadly bears no examination stately on occasion, even seriously, when it is as serious a business as the relative speed of four legs, or of four wheels. The British have several religions, of which this is of course one. Long ago they realized that football is too important a thing to be left to the footballers. And the one compensation for the end of the season for one game is the arrival of the season for the other. The ritual of cricket has long extended into the mythology of folklore. Even so, there are some who do not join the crowd. In the centre of London is a forum named for a naval battle long ago and far away, Trafalgar Square. It's used for pigeons, people and protest. For those who have something to say, to praise or to denounce, the square is London's witness that speech is free and that the law exists to keep it so. This is a concept so rooted that it needs no constitutional sanction, that the law is made for man, not man for the law, and that the state serves the people, not otherwise. From their small island, the British sailed to the ends of the earth. They gave their language and some of their customs to a great new nation 3,000 miles away across the Atlantic. And in the organization of peoples known as the United Nations, both in New York and in its agencies at Geneva and elsewhere, the British share, as the world shares, in the common purposes and efforts and ambitions and fears and hopes of the universal dialogue that gradually and with difficulty constrains the human race to behave in such a fashion that one shall not be ashamed to belong to it. Over the last generation, in a unique and enormous international achievement, without parallel in history, a British Empire was surrendered, transformed and reconstituted into a commonwealth, something that had no precedent. Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and a growing list of new nations in Africa, Asia and the Caribbean, developed together into a multiracial organization involving almost a quarter of the globe. And where their fathers once ruled, this generation now helps freely and eagerly, in many forms of service overseas, in common dignity and partnership, building up knowledge and ability, respect and understanding, creating a relationship of a very special and very mutual value. A century ago, they were building the railroads and steamships of the first industrial revolution. Today, on the shores of Tokyo Bay and the outskirts of Rome, their nuclear engineers build the powerhouses of the atomic age. And at the European Centre for Nuclear Research, their physicists work together with those of 12 other nations in this international environment of the universal atom. Can we fix it? With workshops of power must go laboratories of language, 
crash courses and forcing houses of human communication. And thus departs another. Britain is a subway commuter, a mechanized mole deep below the streets of his city. Britain is a countryman, a cultivator, a of animals with cares and obsessions quite different, and yet somehow much the same. Britain is very old and very young.